kind of hoping for the let's get ready to rumble introduction. <laughs> but that one was pretty good anyway. Uh, so first I wanted to say thanks to Don and to MCMA for having me. Uh, it's a real honor to be able to come and speak to a bunch of students, especially since I am not that old yet. <laughs> At least that's what I keep telling myself. Uh, thanks everybody for driving what probably seemed like hours through endless cornfields to finally reach the bustling metropolis of Pearsville, Missouri. Hope you had a good time uh, so far, sightseeing, taking in the luxuries such as the Holiday Inn, uh, the city's crown jewel Walmart, the 24-hour diner called Pancake City, uh, where you can get a, an item called the Nova Slinger, which is a cheeseburger topped with eggs, topped with hash browns, topped with chili. Uh, so if you want to say that you've accomplished something in Kirksville, you should probably try that. Uh, or you should not try that at all. Um, I actually don't recommend it anymore. So at some point during my tenure here at Truman, a communication professor undoubtedly told me that when you're giving a presentation, one of the first things you have to do is develop credibility with your audience. I'm sure that's one of the communication buzzwords, ethos, pathos, Legos, uh, something like that. Glad you guys got the, uh, the communication theory joke there. Uh, I probably missed that question on the test since I was so busy working for the, uh, the student paper that I didn't have much time to study or do homework. But here I am in front of a bunch of people giving a speech, so I figure I might as well play by the rules. Uh, so I'll tell, yourself, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, and um, Emily probably also mentioned most of this. So I graduated from Truman not too long ago, class of 2008, uh, which I think is six years now. Uh, coming up on 10-year high school reunion, it's kind of crazy. Uh, I feel old, uh, especially in a room with a bunch of people who are in their early 20s. Um, I was the editor-in-chief of the Index here. I moved to San Francisco after graduation, worked at MarketWatch, um, covered companies there. Uh, then I moved to Chicago for Bloomberg, covered <coughs> companies there, and uh, did a little freelancing, uh, covered Sprint for the Kansas City Star, landed my first front page article there uh, for you Kansas Cityans out there. Um, also for you Kansas Cityans out there, sorry that your baseball team is the inferior one in the state. Cardinals. Yes! Uh, <laughs> glad there are some Cardinal fans in the house. So in 2009, I landed a job at the Wall Street Journal, uh, written some pretty big business news stories um, on some pretty big companies. I managed to be a person on the editing team for the Sochi Olympics, um, which was a really great experience, although I did not get to uh, actually go to Russia. Uh, we put the paper together in New York City, so I wasn't in Sochi, which might have been a good thing since uh, you saw the accommodations there. Um, could have ended up, you know, like stuck in a, in a hotel room, locked in there. Since I don't have the physique of a professional bobsled <laughs> writer, I would have just been stuck and have been able to tear myself out of it. Like that guy who posted this photo on Twitter. Uh, so when Don first asked me to give this speech, I started Googling for ideas and I came across a pretty funny post on the media blog Romanesco was titled, Students Are Sick of Being Told There's No Better Time to Be a Journalist. Uh, the post told the story of a couple of Boston University journalism students who said, and I quote, they had listened to their fair share of self-righteous, out-of-touch journalist guest speakers. So like typical college students, they turned that idea into a drinking game. <laughs> okay, so it was just a bingo board, but uh, I went to college too, and we all know that a bingo board can easily be turned into a drinking game. So I wanted to put up their journalist guest speaker cliche bingo board and uh, poke a few holes in some of the ideas that these out-of-touch guest speakers talk about, because the last thing I want to be is an out-of-touch journalist guest speaker. Uh, one of the first squares I want to call to your attention is, how many of you are on Twitter? Anyone? Seriously, if you're not on Twitter by this point and you're a college journalist, uh, I don't know what you're doing. You need to, uh, you need to get on it. It's, uh, it's the most practical way to like aggregate information from anything that you're interested in to uh, your beats that you're following to sources that are in your location. 
Um, it's a fantastic thing, and if you're not on Twitter, uh, I'm not sure what you're doing. Let's see. Oh, and speaking of that, uh, I saw somebody do this at a conference one time, so if anybody has questions, um, instead of doing like a Q&A afterwards, my Twitter handle is at Nate Becker, and if you actually have questions, you can just tweet them at me, and then I'll grab them off my phone here, and, uh, and I'll answer them afterwards. If you don't have questions, no deal, I'm not going to be offended, but if anybody does want to know anything about, you know, being a young journalist, um, getting a job, trying to get ahead in the world, um, I'd be happy to try and take a stab at it. So, um, just hit me there. We'll go back here. Uh, another square on the board here is mention small paper where a career began. Uh, when I was in college, I assumed that I'd start my career off just like that. It's one of a small handful of reporters at some rinky-dink newspaper in nowhere, Missouri. Probably covers such enticing events as dogs crossing the street, tax issues for funding senior centers, and bake sales. After 25 years of toiling away for a little to no pay, I'd eventually be able to make the move to a major metro daily. And I think that's the career path that a lot of people think they're going to have to take. That they need to spend a decade at a tiny newspaper uh, to eventually get where they want to be. But that's not the case all the time. My first real job out of college was the Wall Street Journal. Um, and we hire tons of young reporters. Um, we have lots of people in the newsroom who are under 30. Uh, but if you don't consider yourself worthy of the job, you'll never apply for it. And if you don't apply for it, you can never get it. So don't ever count yourself out of a job because you think you're not there yet. The worst you can do is try. And when you have people who are older than you who are saying, you're going to have to spend 10 years and pay your dues to make it somewhere, um, sometimes there are you know, big places out there who are willing to recognize the talent and try to uh, try to cultivate it. Another one of the uh, squares that I took issue with was the one that says, do you want to be first or right? Uh, you can be both, especially in the information age. Being right doesn't mean you have to be slow. Media is about speed now, and uh, we have the means to be right and fast at the same time. So don't use being right as a crutch for being slow. Uh, another one that kind of bugged me was, you need to be a one-man show. I'm not sure when these terms started coming out of the woodwork for journalists. One-man band, one-man show, as if you're going to be standing in front of somebody with a tuba and a harmonica and like a drum on your foot. Um, lots of media organizations are going to ask you to do a lot. Yes, that's true. They're going to ask you to take photos. They're going to ask you to shoot video. But all that stuff is easier than ever. You've got a smartphone in your pocket. Take it out. Um, you know, shoot some quick video on your iPhone. Uh, take a photo that way, and it's, for the most part, print quality. So, you, uh, it's, it's not like you are going to be doing more than you're capable of doing. Um, the, the young world of journalists are groomed to, uh, <laughs> sounds like she's having a good time. <laughs> The, you know, like, you guys are groomed to, to take in a bunch of information and parse it. Um, and, and you can do that. You can do multiple things at once. This is no longer a, an I'm just going to write a story world. Uh, another one of these squares says, people say journalism is dead, but I think there's no better time to be a journalist. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that it's the greatest time ever to be a journalist. Uh, newspapers had some huge boom days last century when they paid res reporters out the wazoo. They were basically printing money, not thinning their staffs and laying people off. So there very well may have been a better time to be a journalist. Just ask Woodward and Bernstein. They've got a movie about themselves. But on the flip side of that coin, I hear young people who say that they want to go into journalism then some stodgy, crusty old journalist laughs and says, you should probably pick another career field because this one is dying. Or, my best advice to you is get out now. Uh, this is just my opinion, but that stodgy, crusty old jerk who's telling you to get out of the industry is probably the one who's the closest to being laid off because he or she can't adapt to technology, doesn't know what the Twitters are, uh, <laughs> how to use them. The truth is, journalism may have had its heyday decades ago. 
But if you're good at journalism and you love journalism and you have a real interest in, in pursuing it, it's a really enjoyable career. And if you have a career that you enjoy, you're better off than 90% of the people out there who are in the workforce. The key to that, though, is enjoying your job. And that means getting a job that you want. And that's what you're all interested in, right? You came to school to get internships and jobs so you can go out into the world where you can make money and have a real adult job. And after a year of that, you just come home after your real adult job and you sit on the couch and watch TV because you're too tired to go out drinking with your friends. Spoiler alert. That's what happens. Uh, so in the interest of presenting all of you in the real world of jobs, I thought I'd go through a few of my best tips presented in the most ragingly popular form of journalism today, a list. So here are my 10 ways to make yourself irresistible on the job market. Number one, work your ass off for student media. You thought this was going to be a G-rated list, and here I go, dropping the A word on point number one. <laughs> as much as people, and especially your mom and dad, love to hear about good grades, there are real world things that you can't learn in the classroom and things that your professors, sorry professors, just can't teach you. You can learn a lot of those through working for a media outlet on campus, as long as you treat it seriously and professionally. Uh, the clips and samples that you drum up will help get you internships. Those internships can help you get better internships. Those internships can help you get jobs. Number two, get your facts straight. Nothing sends your credibility down the tubes faster than getting the facts wrong. That's with your sources, with your editors, with your readers. Think of how annoying it would be if somebody wrote a story about you and they spelled your name wrong. Or they said you were from Iowa instead of from Missouri. Uh, think about how much credibility you give someone when they give you wrong directions. These same concepts apply to telling stories, so you must check your facts. If you're ever in doubt of a fact or don't understand a concept completely, ask again. Your source wants you to get the information about them right. Number three, really learn to tell a story. When I was in college, it was the time of a multimedia revolution. YouTube was just becoming a thing, which makes me feel really old. Uh, it used to be cool to just shoot a video and then show your family, look mom, I'm on the internet. I'm on TV. Now anybody with a smartphone and the Vine app can do that. Look at what the top media outlets are doing. Now we've got cool long form pieces where as you scroll down, video auto plays, we've got interactive graphics, everything, all in one <coughs> package. The media through which you tell a story is now merely a secondary detail. Concentrate on actually telling the story. Be creative, be sharp, be intelligent, be clear. It doesn't matter if it's a reader in a TV studio or on the page of a newspaper or heard over the airwaves in somebody's car. If you're no good at making the story compelling, then they're going to turn you off or click away. It doesn't matter where it is. It matters that it's actually a good story. So learn to tell your story well. Next point, the five W's and H. The famous who, what, when, where, why, how. I can't tell you how many stories I see, even at my news outlet, that fail to answer one of these questions, at least one of these questions. And this doesn't just go for print. I'm looking at anybody who relays information. Tell the complete story and don't leave your audience wondering about any of these facts. Number five, while we're on the topic of print, fast five, by the way. I was trying to think of what would be a good uh, representation of five. I thought of it decent. Uh, while we're on the topic of print, was he even in Fast Five? I don't know. Um, while we're on the topic of print, ditch the term print reporter. It no longer applies. If you are writing solely for print at this point, you might as well head to the museum, hang out with the dinosaurs, take your fax machine and your Sony Walkman with you. Print reporting doesn't exist. You write, you write words. Uh, where they appear is of secondary importance. Point number six, hustle all the time. Some of the best advice I ever got was, as the editor-in-chief of the student paper, to work harder than literally every other person in the newsroom. When people know you're working hard for them, they're happy to work hard for you. And in the same capacity, if you're working hard for your boss, 
they're going to go to bat for you when you need it. That doesn't just mean being in the office longer than everyone else. Effort counts. Number seven, don't be a diva. You're still young. Hell, I'm still young, and we still have a lot to learn. Our more experienced peers, and some of our equally experienced peers who are exceptionally talented at students' papers, internships, and jobs, will be able to help make us better only if we listen. Let editors make changes to your copy. And if you don't like the changes that they make, ask them why they made them. They'll have an explanation. Um, editors don't just change things willy-nilly because they want to change things. Uh, maybe some do. Um, but when I'm editing something, I don't change it just because I think it needs change. But a lot of reporters come back and say, oh, you're just trying to like squash my creative juices or whatever. And it's like, this, this needed to be changed for a reason, and here's why. Uh, instead of getting mad about somebody changing your stuff, ask them why they changed it, and they'll tell you. Uh, going along with that theme of don't be a diva, your resume in journalism should always, always, always be one page. Uh, I went to a meeting with Rich Holden, who is the director of the Dow Jones News Fund. The guy worked at the Wall Street Journal for two decades. And in this meeting, he said, my resume is one page long. And if I can fit it on one page, a college student can fit it on one page. Uh, number eight, specialize in something complicated. Anybody can go to a city council meeting and watch what happens, voice record what happens, take notes on what happened, and then relay that information in a story. The best way to get a good job quickly is to become an expert in something that is complicated. Business, health, science. Uh, not everybody can understand how business and the economy work. Not everybody can wrap their mind around science or health stories. So find a topic where you won't just be a parrot for general information. Then study and report to become an expert on it. Potential employers are looking for people who can distill difficult subjects into things that their readers can understand. If you do that, you've got a foot in the door already. Number nine, for God's sakes, get people's names right. That's not how you spell my last name, or my first name. <laughs> uh, ask for spellings, ask for pronunciations. If you're on the air, don't pronounce somebody's name wrong. Uh, nothing makes you look dumber than getting that wrong. I had a professor at Truman once who would automatically fail you for your entire assignment if you spelled someone's name wrong in the article. And I think that's an insanely smart strategy. Uh, the easiest thing on the planet to get right is someone's name when they want to be in a story um, or they want to be on TV. They want to talk to you and they want people to see them in the media. Uh, so they'll be more than happy to tell you how to spell their name. Number 10, uh, be willing to travel. If I had decided to stay in Missouri for the rest of my life, I would have never gotten the jobs or the experience that I've had. Uh, the Wall Street Journal doesn't have anybody in Missouri. There's just, there's, you know, the media market is in much bigger cities than that. Uh, New York, San Francisco, Chicago. Um, San Francisco for more like Silicon Valley um, tech-related news. But I managed to travel, um, you know, got to a few great cities, and if I had expected to just stay in Missouri for the rest of my life, I would have never had those opportunities. Uh, and what I can tell you is that you're young, and you've got the opportunity, you know, you're not tied down right now. You, I mean, you may have a significant other, but you likely don't have children at this point. Uh, so you can pick up and move and go somewhere that's really cool and do it for two years and get some amazing experience that you wouldn't be able to get in Missouri, in Kansas, in Iowa, uh, because the news outlets just don't exist there. So be willing to take a risk to pick up stakes and to go somewhere new and, uh, and try something different. Because of my journalism career, I've stood just feet from a pre-president, Barack Obama, while he was still campaigning for his first election. I've been in the locker room at Yankee Stadium, I've sat in on dinner at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. I watched from the press box while Rafael Nadal beat Novak Djokovic in the U.S. Open Championship. None of that would have happened had I not been open to travel. You're young, so use your time wisely. 
New cities are a great experience, and the places you leave behind are never more than a few hours plane ride away. I mean, I came back here for this, it was two and a half hours. It's, it's never too far away. You can make it back, you can see your family, your family can come to you and see a really cool new spot. Um, but don't limit yourself in your career by not being willing to go somewhere else, because I've gone to three new and different cities, and I've loved each of them. Um, it's really cool to go somewhere and to kind of uh, forge a new path. So that's the list I've got, uh, and I'm sticking to it. And I'm going to check for any questions, if anybody's posted anything to Twitter. Uh, and if not, and it looks like not, nobody has questions, I'm going to cut it off there. Thanks very much, guys. I really, uh, I really appreciate you. Uh,